Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I am very glad to be joined by Una Archer, who is the founder of Parenting After Separation. She's also a Circle of Security facilitator and specialises in children's emotional security and helping parents to soften the impact of separation and to address any emotional or behavioural issues which might arise after that. So we want you to talk today about how to protect children from emotional abuse and neglect. But I think it's really important before we get started with that is to just clarify that what we're talking about here is the abuse that doesn't meet the threshold for safeguarding concerns with local authorities. But deep down as a parent, you know it's not right and you feel quite powerless to do anything about it. So what we want to do is give you some tools today to help you feel more confident in dealing with that. So, Una, can you give me any examples of those sort of things that might be popping up for parents that are feeling this mm -hmm. discomfort? Yes, sure. Well, imagine if the child um, comes back home from the other parent and says, oh, you know, mommy just took my bag and took every single thing out of my bag. Or they might say something like, well, daddy doesn't let me come out of my bedroom until 8 a.m. I just have to stay there regardless of when I wake up. And you know that from, from the history, there's not much you can do about it. You, know, you can't really, well, depending on your co-parenting relationship, you might or might not be able to address it with the other parent, but it just leaves you with that deep deep sense of discomfort and also it might remind you what it was how you felt when you were in the relationship with the other parent it's really hard for parents to deal with their own emotions in those moments because it's it's that confusion i guess between what action do i need to take right now is there action i need to take do i like say contact my ex do i contact social services so what what advice would you give parents that are in that sort of conflict between what to do? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think it's helpful to just first take a step back and have a look at what happens for us as parents in situations like that, and then how we might respond based on that. So if that, you know, if when you hear that, and you get a strong reaction, you know, either your heart sings or your blood boils, you might even feel like the ground is literally rolling from underneath your feet. It might be that you go into a fight or flight response just in that moment. And as parents, we go into fight or flight response so often, I believe many times every single day you know any school run or i think 95 percent of school run don't go by without at least like a little bit of edging towards fight or flight but if you've been through difficult relationship difficult separation in a difficult co-parenting relationship still so discomfort and conflict in the background you know in those situations i think the fight or flight response is much easier uh, it's, it is much easier to trigger it and it is stronger and it takes longer to down regulate so and I think sort of meeting our children emotionally is a bit like meeting them physically so I'll use my hands to illustrate that so imagine that's you and that's your child here and the child says well um, my other parent don't let me come up, go out of my bedroom until 8 a.m. And you hear that. And if you're triggered into a fight response, your energy goes up and you feel like, right, I've got to do something about it right now. There's no time to think, consider. And you might get an idea that you feel just so right about and you just spring into action. And so emotionally, it would be like a child is here and it kind of shoot right over. And by the way, there's no judgment. I've been there many, many times talking from experience here. And it might, you know, as an action, it might look like you might say something to your child about the other parent that you later regret and it's too much. And, you know, they might not need they might not need to know those things or you might just go and message your ex, even though you know that 
it just will be counterproductive. So that's kind of when we respond from that uh, flight response, we tend to overshoot. The other side of it is flight or freeze when we withdraw. It's like you might feel, you know what, it's just too much for me to deal with right now. Like, why do I have to deal with this again? And you just kind of sink in and on the sofa or just kind of hide in the fridge. And uh, so, and then kind of we get so wrapped up in our own world and stories again, and which leave the child on their own. And it might not be comfortable to talk about it or hear about it, but it's so helpful because when we understand what's happening to us and why, we can begin to make different choices. So in that moment, if you feel that you're triggered, it's best to just do nothing, take a break, press that pause button. <laughs> and until you feel like you just feel more like a normal self and it can take a few breaths or it might take a walk around the block but just wait it out and so the response that I think would be helpful for a child in that situation from the emotional security perspective is to really stay with their experience and say something like well so I hear you have to stay at 8 a.m um, in the other parent's house what's that like for you you know tell me I want to know and then just let them talk and talk and talk and you know I understand it might not be your usual way of communicating it might take time to build it up but just it's a kind of a general direction it's really um if you can pause your agenda take it to a therapist counselor trusted friend to sort it out and in that moment stay with your child's experience and because we know that it's not so much for children it's not so much the actual events that affect them or how they will affect them but it's the sense that they make of them and the tools and the resources that um, they have to deal with them and so and when we connect with them when we talk with them about it that's when we can empower and that's where that protection bit that we speak about happens so, so I, powerful so simple but powerful and i say simple not meaning that it's not going to be hard work but not like a 10 step process to go through it's something that you can you can start practicing right away and i think the other thing that i kind of want to highlight from that is also the opposite of that which is what they're potentially experiencing in the other house mm -hmm. so therefore there's almost that that double power of this is that they're not getting those needs met by someone who who really struggles to make that connection so when you are able to meet them in that moment it's really really doubly effective because you know you are showing them that they are heard mm -hmm. and that they do matter and if that's a message that they're not getting elsewhere either it, something like that can really help with that attachment and bring and making it feel a lot more secure and help with your relationship if there has been any conflict between you and your mm -hmm. child there always will be <laughs> yeah yeah I agree and you know, one of the things that I believe in is that one time so diffi uh, diff difficult just that one secure relationship can mm -hmm. see the child through and really help them feel whole and, and settled and trust in their go their own goodness the goodness of other people and life but on the back of what you're saying if they're not met like that by other people it might be harder for a child to talk and open up in in that way because they might feel you know they might expect to be blamed or belittled or you know that you know whatever they're saying will be minimized so in a way as you say it makes it more important that you offer that to your child <laughs> i feel like i'm getting on my soapbox now but at the same time it makes it more difficult so if it is hard and you if you can just you feel like you're just coming close to the door but the door is not quite open it's okay don't give up just keep going you know just keep just sort of keep the door open keep inviting that conversation absolutely and using that door analogy it's almost like you just sit outside the room 
And just sitting outside the room is reassurance itself sometimes when you're not quite ready. The child's not quite ready to have that conversation, knowing that you're still there is the reassurance enough if, if it's a leap from where they've been. Mm. I think, let's say, going back to the protection element, it's it's important that we, we protect them from our own emotions in that as well. So no judgment with that. You know, we're all guilty of that projection at times that we talked about. And so protecting our children is sometimes also about recognising when we are putting our own emotions out there and this helps with our recovery as well so yes it's incredibly helpful for the child but it's also helpful for us then we it's a win-win really isn't it mm-hmm. yes exactly they were really really powerful and, and like I say we do appreciate how difficult it is when you have a difficult ex let's let's put it like that um, and it can very much feel like you, at times, you want to just tell the other parent to do these things. But actually, one, they may not be capable, you may not be able to have that conversation, but two, you know, focus where you can, where you can do the work, where you, where you do have some, some control. And, and this is empowering for you in a, at a time when actually you may, may feel like everything is out of your control. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, and you know, I think those moments of connection when they, when they happen, they're so empowering and they can give you so much confidence of knowing that, yes, you know, I'm giving my child what they need because when you're in that moment, you just know. And then, you know, whatever... You know, especially if you're undermined by either parent or you, you have different views, it can be just such an amazing confidence boost to have that experience. Yeah, much needed as well. So that's been incredible. I'm sure um, people get lots of value out of that. Um, I will respond to any comments and I'll tag Una in anything that I think she would be better off answering as well. Um, so for those of you that are watching this on replay, um, don't don't feel you can't ask questions. You're still you're still able to. And um, one question that um, has come up is, how do you? Is there any advice you could give a parent who, when it gets to contact, they notice that their child's anxiety is starting to starting to rise and maybe make some protestations about going to contact is there any any advice you can give a parent to stay with them and use this technique well I think just that what we covered today can, can be really helpful and I think it just depends so much on the history the context what's actually happening the age of the child so it's yeah like if I was talking with a parent, I would ask lots of questions. And so just through that questioning and reflection, often the answers come up. But just as a general advice, yes, just breathe, keep listening. And also just sort of generally from talking with parents that might not may or may not apply, I feel that um, sometimes parents feel very responsible to ensure that um, their child has a good relationship with their other parent and, and they force and cajole the child to see the other parent if they don't want to. And again, you know, this is such a tricky balance and I know that it's easy to interpret what I'm going to say in a wrong way, but what I want to say, just really remember that your relationship with your child is your responsibility. And by being, um, you know, that grounded listening presence, that difficult situation can be an opportunity to connect. And so, and I would encourage, just, just focus on that. And, you know, if there's anything you can do to support your child's relationship with the other parent, of course, like do that. But I like, don't feel like you have to do that at the expense of your relationship with your child and undermining your child's trust in you. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's really important because, yeah, it's with certainly with parents who refuse to accept responsibility and are very quick to blame, 
it can feel like you have to prove yourself that you are trying everything. And I think you're right. If you just come back into the technique that you talked about and, and focus on connecting with your child, then actually a lot of that other stuff will sort of resolve itself out of that connection, whatever that may bring. Yes, yes, yes. And at the same time, I understand that it can be very scary because when you kind of, you know, stay in your patch and you just give space for the other parent to either step up or not step up, you know, do you, well, lots of things can happen, but what can happen is either the other parent will step up and you'll be ple pleasantly surprised, or if they don't step up and the child's kind of is left not met by them then you know there's an opportunity to really face the reality and the loss and and the lack of the connection so but again i think it's better faced and dealt with rather than kind of patched up and hidden um, even though i know it's not option not for the faint of heart like they, it all comes from that secure place doesn't it and being able to have those conversations mm -hmm. That's been brilliant. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us today. And I'm sure everyone has got a lot of value out of that. And I say, if you have any questions, do pop them below the video and I will make sure that they get a response. But thank you so much for watching and thank you, Una, for sharing your expertise with us today. Mm -hmm. Take care, everyone. Bye.